Events are transmitted to the palms of our hand 24 hours a day. Events which surprise us, occasionally even frighten us. We're going to bring you some of the most bizarre and mysterious natural phenomena on the planet. From the sea that turns to cappuccino, to the massive holes that open and swallow buildings, to an avian apocalypse on New Year's Eve. What makes that happen for them just to drop out of the sky like that? Using eyewitness accounts, news footage and experts and scientists, we are going to try and explain what on earth is going on. For our first set of weird events, we're going to be looking at stories that had people quaking in their boots. When animals die in strange ways, superstitions can run wild. And some are left fearing the end of the world is nigh. From the old wives' tales of rains of fish, to the weird and spooky event in the American Deep South. But first, we're travelling to California, where on the 8th of March in 2011, the locals awoke to something quite fishy. As the sun came up over Redondo Harbour, an ominous scene was revealed. Overnight, the entire marina had become choked with death. Now, Californian authorities are carrying out a large-scale clean-up after a million dead sardines were found floating in a marina just south of Los Angeles. In some parts of King Harbour, the water was almost half a metre thick with dead fish. The carnage was incredible. Look, there was the odd survivor trying to make a bid to escape a grisly fate. But it was creepy, to say the least, and soon a worried crowd gathered to view this tragedy. Oh, it's sad. It's really sad. I can't believe how big these sardines are. Uh, it makes me wonder what's in the water. We're used to seeing fish hauled in by a trawler, but for more than a million to just die spontaneously, well, that's totally out of the ordinary. Speculation ran riot as to the cause of these alien scenes. I didn't think schools of fish could be this big. No, there was way over a million. It's pretty mind-boggling, I think. So why had so many fish swum into the harbour and then what could have killed them? Mass gatherings of fish are not unusual. In fact, this is exactly what sardines are known for. They shoal in their millions, following colder currents rich in plankton. As the fish feast on this plentiful food, they in turn become dinner as predators flock for miles around to feast on them. Sharks cut through the shoal, which twists and turns like one giant organism. Dolphins join in herding the fish to the surface, where the sardines have nowhere to go and they're attacked from every angle. So, had the fish at Redondo been chased into the harbour by hungry predators? Or had the sardines come into the marina to shelter from a storm that had blown up over the ocean that night? Well, when they actually tested the fish, they found another, more likely culprit. The sardines' last supper had been toxic algae. Their bodies were full of a poisonous acid. Scientists believe the effects of these toxins disorientated the fish, leading them to accidentally swim into this dead end. Once there, local experts say a more obvious danger awaited them. Uh, huge numbers of fish in, here in the harbour, 
uh, and the sun goes down so there's no photosynthesis going on so there's no oxygen being created and there's just the fish consuming the oxygen so when they consume it all it's all gone and then they, they basically suffocate. Whatever brought them into the harbour, the nail in their coffins had been the lack of oxygen. Death by suffocation, not a pleasant way to die. And as 75 tonnes of fish started to rot, the smell wasn't very pleasant either. But their deaths weren't entirely in vain. The circle of life was completed as more than a million sardines were sent off to be used as fertiliser. Our next story involves tales that go back to ancient times. Worldwide, events have taken place that left eyewitnesses gazing skyward and asking, how? So we're off to London in search of answers to a very strange rain indeed. According to the expression, it's raining cats and dogs. But of course, that never really happens. Yet tales of animals falling from the sky is a phenomenon that spans the centuries and one particular creature is mentioned time and time again. Fish falling from the heavens like rain. Surely fiction, not fact. But Oliver Crimmen, the fish curator of the Natural History Museum, believes that these tall tales might actually have some flesh on the bones. In 1984, I was sitting at my desk in the museum. I got a call um, from somebody who said that fish had fallen from the sky in London. Now, we do get some fairly unusual calls, and I had heard of this phenomenon before, but the, the caller was doubting that they would be taken seriously at all. Mr. Rong Langdon had um, actually left the fishes lying in his garden and a reporter went and, and took some from the roof and from the yard outside his house and brought them back to the museum. But come on, could this really be true? Did these very fish really fall from the sky or is this some fanciful tale, no more than an elaborate hoax? It's not impossible that somebody scattered fish around. In this case, they didn't bother making them look very pretty and they carefully chose species which would be found nearby from the river. It all looks pretty feasible. So, the species lived in the Thames. The river is, after all, where the fish belong. But how could they find their way into the sky in order to fall from it? Well, there is one potential explanation. We don't associate fish with uh, aerial transport at all, but if we look for an, a natural phenomenon that could really account for fish landing on the ground, really the best going is a water spout. Now, a water spout is similar to something you'd find on land. Just as tornadoes can pick up trees and houses, a water spout could suck up fish. These are then carried along in the storm until it loses its energy and its aquatic load is deposited on land, like fish out of water. It all looks pretty feasible. And I think if we take the number of reports and their varying quality, then um, I, I think the phenomenon definitely occurs. So it seems that science has an explanation for these somewhat fanciful tales. That said, the theory is constantly being tested by new events. In Australia in 2010, fish fell from the sky in the middle of a dry red desert miles from any water. That must have been quite a water spout. But let's hope in this age of communication and better technology that we finally get some photographic evidence of fish raining from the sky. Then we can transform this phenomena from myth into scientific fact. But when something totally out of the ordinary happens, fact doesn't always seem like the most believable explanation. For our next story, we head over the Atlantic to the American state of Arkansas, where something quite incredible, and some might say apocalyptic, took place. The 
the small city of Beebe in the American Deep South, home to 5,000 people and one and a half million red-winged blackbirds. People and birds live side by side. The roost is set amongst the houses. And as the sun goes down, Beebe's noisiest residents paint the sky black as they come in for the night. But on New Year's Eve 2010, the evening display got the attention of not just the locals, but media all around the world. Just before folks in BB rang in the new year, many witnessed an uncanny resemblance to the Hitchcock movie, The Birds. As midnight approached, it wasn't fireworks falling through the sky in BB, it was blackbirds in their thousands. They're everywhere. I'm not sure what's going on. They're dead. I'm better As 911 calls flooded in, the authorities swung into action. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering why all the birds are just like dying. In New Year's Eve, I thought it might be some prank, somebody calling in or somebody taking some drugs and was seeing things. And I was coming down this road here and I started seeing the blackbirds all in the road. And it uh, really hit me that this, this was a real call and wasn't bogus. For the residents of BB, there was absolutely no doubt this was really happening, as birds lay dead and dying right in their backyards. I heard a thump towards the back side of the house. I actually thought it was someone in the house. And then it started being a little, the thumps came a little bit faster. So I walked outside, and that's when I saw the birds scattered on the ground as far as I could see. They were just everywhere. I looked down the street, and it looked like, I would describe it as a war zone. It looked like... Uh, somebody came out with heavy artillery and just blew these birds out of the sky. To be honest, the birds had never been the most popular neighbours. They were said to be noisy, smelly, and their mess was everywhere. The town had long wanted the roost gone, but dead on their doorsteps on New Year's Eve, this was more like a nightmare than a wish come true. It really is like something out of a horror film. Every yard in the area looks a lot like this one. Dozens of birds litter the ground, and the scariest part is no one knows how they got here. I thought, well, someone has finally poisoned the birds. Obviously, suspicion and rumor were rife. How could 5,000 blackbirds just fall from the sky? The people of BB needed answers, and they needed them quick. It was time to call in the experts. Karen Rowe is a state ornithologist she returned home from a New Year party to find her phone full of panicked messages. I called Robbie and he informed me that there were birds all over BB. The birds are going to hold the answer. If a bird's dead, he's going to tell you why he died. And I said, pick up a variety of birds. If you see different species, pick them up and wear gloves because we don't know what happened. By the morning, Robbie had been joined by a cleanup team kitted out in full hazard suits surreal scenes to wake up to, which did little to calm the locals' fears. There were guys in white suits walking around looking like spacemen picking up dead birds. And I'm wondering, do we need the same thing? Because what makes that happen for them just to drop out of the sky like that? But before the scientists could even test the birds, the story had started to take on its own momentum. More questions tonight as to what caused thousands of blackbirds to fall from the sky. You know, there's been several opinions of what happened that night. It was the government, it was aliens, it was the sign of the end of times. I've heard that it was the Lord's doing, that this was, a, this was a punishment and a warning to us, and maybe it was. One online commentator suggests the most likely explanation is that the blackbirds simply collided mid-air with an invisible UFO. So why did they choose this particular year uh, to, to fall out of the sky? The massive amount of public and media attention to this event really heightened our awareness to the fact that we really had to go the extra mile. Rather than relying on just one laboratory, we used three laboratories to conduct the test so that we make sure that all the laboratory tests concurred and there were no possibilities of someone having an unusual result that we might need to further look at. 
Kevin Keel was one of the pathologists charged with finding the answers. In this case, you know, most of the birds were in, in good nutritional condition and seemed to be uh, fairly healthy, but they did have a lot of traumatic lesions. And this bird that I have here actually has a broken wing. And the birds that we received consistently had lots of hemorrhage in the body cavities. And these things suggest to us that there is a blunt force trauma to the birds. They suggest that they flew into something or that something hit them. With so many birds, it's unlikely that something hit 5,000 of them all at one time. And all of the labs agreed. The birds had flown into stationary objects and died. But that wasn't the end of the story. They may have found the cause of death, but why had so many birds, 5,000 of them, flown into things at the same time? Well, the numbers can in part be explained by the flocking nature of these birds. You see, they're very much like a species of bird we get here in the UK, starlings. Both flock in huge numbers, creating incredible aerial displays. I mean, just look at this. A murmuration of starlings really is one of the wonders of nature. Beautiful. But if some of the birds make a mistake, they can all wind up in trouble. And every now and again, groups of starlings fall dead, right here in the UK. Birds like this starling have eyesight that's perfectly adapted for seeing in daylight. Their eyes are on the sides of their head, so they can see all around. But inside that eye, the cornea is packed with cone cells. And these are what give it its colour vision. Perfect for finding prey and keeping on the lookout for predators. Cone cells might be great for the day, but they're as good as useless in the dark. At night time, BB's blackbirds are pretty much blind. So when they took to the air, crashing into things was an inevitable consequence. But it was still a mystery as to why thousands of blackbirds would be flying around at night in the pitch black when normally they would be asleep. So we've talked to everyone we could in the city and got uh, numerous reports of an extraordinary loud noise. Some said a propane cannon, some said an service to air missiles, some said uh, professional, not normal, but professional uh, select grade fireworks that shook their windows, caused them to wake up, caused their children to wake up. That night I had heard approximately 13 to 14 loud booms, uh, kind of like what a sonic boom would be. I'd say 10 minutes after that I started receiving calls about blackbirds that were falling out of the sky. So finally they had a culprit. They weren't poisoned, they hadn't been shot down, it wasn't even a UFO. It was loud bangs, perhaps New Year's fireworks which had scared the birds out of their roost. And unable to see at night, the blackbirds crashed into the nearby houses and died. The problem was, it was such an extraordinary event, the explanation was almost too simple. You know, I've even heard this referred to as the aflocalypse. And of course, nothing brings out people worried about the end of the world than something happening at New Year's Eve, the dawn of the new year. So suddenly I had tons of people calling me because they found one dead cedar waxwing under their plate glass window. And they thought that it was part of the apocalyptic bird mortality happening around the world. I'm sure if I walked outdoors and saw birds falling out of the sky, I'd be a little disturbed too. But as a biologist, one of the most disturbing things is the fact that we deal exclusively in facts. And if we're not dealing in facts, we'll tell you this is a hypothesis. And we were telling the truth, and it wasn't necessarily being accepted. You see, sometimes people just don't want facts to get in the way of a good story. BB was just the start of a spate of bird deaths around the globe that some people thought was a sign that the end of the world was nigh. 
But the doomsayers needn't have worried because events like this have been taking place for generations. What all these weird deaths show is nature's power to spook us. From the fish that use up all their oxygen and suffocate, to the water spouts that supposedly sprinkle fish from the sky, and the unfortunate birds who flew to their deaths on New Year's Eve. When animals die in strange circumstances, some people are left fearing the apocalypse has come. Next, we go in hunt of stories that will chill you to the bone. As residents of this fair land, we know only too well about the perils of ice, but I'm going to tell you about ice on an altogether grander scale. From the mysterious lumps that fall from the sky, to the herd of creatures that were very much in the wrong place at the wrong time. For that story, we travel to America's frozen state. March 2011 in Alaska, just on the edge of the Arctic Circle. Flying over the region was a team from the National Park Service tracking a herd of musk oxen with satellite tags. As they scoured the snowy tundra, they spotted an eerie scene below. There appeared to be something sticking out of the ice, and on closer inspection, they saw the horns and fur, and what was attached to them was truly shocking. The bodies of 55 musk oxen frozen solid to the spot. So what terrible tragedy could have befallen these animals? How could they have ended up entombed in ice? Musk oxen are incredibly hardy creatures, one of the few large mammals capable of living year-round in the inhospitable Arctic environment. They're protected from the bitter weather by two layers of fur. But no amount of insulation could save them from what fate was sending their way. You see, the herd had been crossing a frozen bay to reach feeding grounds on the other side. But out at sea, a storm was brewing up. The frozen platform they were stood on disintegrated as a tidal surge pushed from under the ice and the herd were plunged into the freezing water. Many of them probably drowned in the panic and confusion that ensued. But if that wasn't enough to contend with, Trapped in the water, any survivors had to face the cold. And with air temperatures at minus 30, it didn't take long to refreeze, and their spine-chilling demise was frozen for posterity. Next, we're travelling home to the Great British Isles. Far from the Arctic Circle, but not a stranger to the cold. But then, what happened one July day in 2009 was even quite extraordinary for a British summer. We're all familiar with this weather phenomenon, balls of ice pelting down on the earth. Hail can even get rather large, so much so, it becomes like missiles. But imagine if something like this fell out of the sky. A grandfather has been hit by a big block of ice which fell from the sky while he was in his garden. It's true. Enjoying a sunny day in Bristol, David Gammon thought he'd had his bacon. It's now down to about the size of an orange, but nonetheless, you know, travelling at 120 miles an hour or so, it, it comes as quite a shock. It's rather like being hit by a fast bowler with a cricket ball. And that would be painful. But where in the heavens had this single block of ice come from in the middle of a summer's day? Could it in some way be a mega-sized relation to hail? For hail to form, you need one of these. Cumulonimbus, giant storm clouds that climb to enormous heights. At the top, the air temperature is cold enough for ice crystals to form. And as these are jostled around inside the cloud, they grow and grow, until eventually they're forced down to Earth. 
either because they've got too heavy or a strong downdraft from the storm pushes them out. Darren Bett is one of the BBC's weather forecasters. There are cases of hailstones the size of golf balls, hailstones even the size of grapefruit. But what fell on a car in Florida in 2007 was way bigger than a grapefruit. What started as a 45 centimetre block of ice not only took out the back windscreen, but also sent the car a metre into the air with the impact. These large chunks of ice are very, very heavy and I don't know of any updrafts that can keep them up in the air and build them and grow them in the same way that a hailstorm can. Also, they seem to be coming from cloudless skies. Not only are they too heavy to be hail, but without a cloud to have formed them, the hail theory is frankly out the window. So where could the finger point next? Well, if you look up, you're likely to see one potential culprit flying by. Could they have fallen from a plane? Horik Kelleher is the head of airworthiness at the Civil Aviation Authority. If the ice is completely clear, then we are pretty sure it's most likely not a, an aviation source. But sometimes we have reports of ice that's coloured. Um, that usually suggests there is uh, chemical content, which, which we do use in treating toilet waste. So, beware of blue ice. Its origins could be somewhat unsavoury. But then only 5% of reported cases in the UK can be linked to planes anyway. So that leaves us scratching our heads about the other 95%. Experts have named these unidentified falling objects as mega cryometeors. And with a name like that, it would suggest they came from space. But on closer inspection, they don't have enough dust or iron content to be typical meteors. So for now, the scientists are actually out of ideas. So for the moment, large chunks of ice falling to Earth remain a mystery. But there is one thing that's certain. If one hits you, it's going to hurt you. The largest ever recorded weighed 90 kilograms. That's 200 pounds. And when that reached terminal velocity at a speed of around 100 miles an hour, well, that would be like being hit by an African elephant. Not good. Indeed. All these stories remind us that nature can do the most unexpected of things. From the spine-chilling end that befell a herd of musk oxen, to the mysterious chunks of ice that leave the scientific world flummoxed. So much of the natural world can not only shock us, but also leave us searching for answers. Next, we're taking to the oceans, where the sea can do the most alien of things. A phenomenon that makes the night sea glow so bright it's visible from space. And a natural event that's fatal to thousands of seabirds. But we start down under, where otherworldly scenes pulled in a big crowd. Australia, the epitome of beach culture. Sand, sea and surf. But what happens when this turns to this? Overnight, the ocean had been whipped up into something quite extraordinary. When the waves would push in, I'd like push the foam up real high. When it hit Yamba in New South Wales on the 24th of August 2007, it smothered everything and everyone. Locals flooded to the beach to join in the foam party. The waves were lifting the foam, but you couldn't actually see breaking waves. We even had one member of my wife's family disappeared in it, and it took us quite a while to find him. The sight was so spectacular, it didn't take long for images of people coated in foam to flash around the world. And Yamba became known as the Cappuccino Coast. But what was going on? Why had the sea whipped up like cream? To find out, we're heading to the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton, where Dr Simon Boxall is a coastal expert. 
Over the last few years, we've seen some fantastic seafoam events. A lot of people assume it's caused by pollution. In actual fact, it's not. It's caused by these things. It's caused by plankton, phytoplankton primarily. And plankton is the basis of much of the life in the sea, the bottom link in the food chain, feeding everything from tiny fish to the giants of the ocean. And plankton supports us too. Much of the Earth's oxygen is produced by these tiny organisms. As the phytoplankton die, they release various compounds. When these things are agitated, they create sea foam. They act like surfactants, almost like washing up liquid in some ways. This combination of strong blooms, strong wave activity, produces the most spectacular sea foam shows on the planet. In the case at Yamba, the event happened after inland floods washed nutrients from farmland soil out to sea. These enriched waters are the perfect habitat for a massive bloom of plankton. Now, when the plankton was healthy, nothing happened. But when the bloom started to die, a surfactant was given off, which, when whipped up by a storm, produced foam on a gigantic scale. Right, whilst on one side of the world the Cappuccino Coast is a tourist attraction, we travel next across the Pacific to the Washington coastline, where in November 2009, the foam that whipped up had altogether more serious consequences. A full-blown wildlife crisis tonight on the northwest coastline. Thousands of seabirds are dying from a slimy foam that stretches from Washington's Olympic coastline all the way to the northern Oregon coastline. Foam on the beach. That's not unusual at all. But this foam was killer foam. This was ugly smelling, ugly looking, and incredibly tall. Thousands of seabirds dead and dying along 300 miles of the American West Coast. Offshore species showing up on land in scenes reminiscent of a man-made disaster. The scope of the situation is hard for even the scientists to grasp. The wildlife center of the north coast near Astoria is flat out overwhelmed. Oof, even though I've been picking them up, I go back to the same place, there's more birds coming in. The birds in the foam were offshore species, mures, grebes and loons, only seen on the beach when they're really in trouble. So volunteers started getting themselves organized to head out and rescue them. Typically, when I come out here and walk on the beach, I could walk for a mile or two and see one or two dead birds. But on this day, obviously, there were uh, literally hundreds that you could see. And they were wet, sandy. It was really a mess. I'd never seen anything like that. Wildlife centers cleared the decks, but they simply couldn't keep up with the deluge. Every little available space that we could find, we had walled off to make an enclosure. We had kennels up on the counters. I mean, just about any available space we could find. As the rescue efforts struggled to keep up, even the scientists were overwhelmed by this event. Julia Powish is an ornithologist at the University of Washington. I've been a seabird biologist for about 25 years, and um, I've seen a lot of death. This event was huge. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, I hope never to see anything like it again. So what was causing such an enormous and devastating event? Well, as the scientists looked to figure it out, they came across something in the archives that might help them. Two years earlier, 800 miles down the coast at Monterey Bay in California, seabirds had died in their thousands. Rafe Cadella at the University of Santa Cruz is an ocean ecologist, and he was involved in unraveling the mystery. And initially, when the birds started coming in, it was assumed that it was from a oil spill. But as soon as they tested them, they realized that there was no petroleum products on the birds. And so at that point, it gets classified as something called a mystery spill. At the time, there was a natural event happening out at sea that's known as a red tide, a mass of algae that group together in huge numbers. Some of these can be very toxic, but this particular dinoflagellate algae had never been recorded causing any harm before. 
we're trying to figure out, well, what's the connection between this dinoflagellate that's supposed to be harmless and what's going on with these birds. We had this red tide offshore, but on the beach, there was this foam piling up. We assumed the foam had something to do with the algae, but we didn't know exactly what was going on. The birds in the foam looked bedraggled. And these are species that spend much of their time diving underwater, almost swimming to catch their prey. To stay warm, they rely on their terribly efficient down layer, which is not only insulating, but vitally waterproof, keeping the cold water away from their skin. Yet the birds on the beach were freezing, so Rafe and his colleagues began experimenting to see what was happening to their feathers. If you dip feathers into normal water, I just dipped that in and nothing happened. The feather is still nice and fluffy. The problem is that when we dip it into the foam, instead of popping back out, it's just all clotted down. And so the top of the feather is completely covered in this sort of nasty goo. Eventually all that down is going to be collapsed all the way against the quill of the feather and it's no longer waterproof at all. It's as if you went swimming in the cold ocean in a wetsuit and all of a sudden your wetsuit dissolved. You wouldn't last very long. And that's exactly what happened to the birds. The result was the largest known mortality of marine birds anywhere in the world ever due to an algal bloom. 8,000 bodies washed up in this event, and it's thought that many thousands more died out at sea. But for the rescue birds, there was hope, as the scientists found a relatively simple fix. One of the things that, that came out of our study is they very quickly realized that if you get to the birds before they actually die, all you need to do is put them in clean water and keep them warm. And they can clean themselves. It's just a matter of getting rid of this foam and keeping them from going into hypothermia. At the rescue centers, this was encouraging news. But the birds were in such poor condition, it was a fight against the clock. To get the birds back to their being waterproof again and getting the al toxic algae off of them, we would swim them. And so we would get as many as we could in here at one time. And um, they'd be in here just, just a very short period. The water, of course, would turn just yellow-green. It was pretty horrible to see. It took more than one washing to get that algae off of them. And uh, by about three days of washing, three or four, we started noticing a difference. For the lucky ones, intensive care from the volunteers restored them to health and with their waterproofing back, many were capable of returning home. Scientists think that this incident didn't have any long-term effects on the seabird populations. You see, nature is terribly resilient. It always seems to bounce back, even when it's been faced with what appears to be total devastation. Nevertheless, it is surprising that an organism as small as algae can cause so much trouble around the world. But it's not all death and destruction. Algal blooms can play host to something altogether more spectacular. For this story, we're travelling to the Indian Ocean, where a phenomenon took place that was nothing short of magical. In 1982, Howell Phillips was the captain of a tanker crossing the Persian Gulf when his ship sailed into what looked like another planet. A dull green glow is the only way I can explain it. And it was a weird, a really weird feeling because it, you felt as if you were in a sphere of light green, translucent, which stretched from horizon to horizon. You couldn't tell the difference between the sky and the sea. 